Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to remind our crowd about the uh, two rules we have about the college. One is uh, one fall at a time. The second is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, we have a brief announcements period. Two, our speaker will then speak for up to an hour. Then we will have our, our uh, questions. And then we will have our infamous rebuttal period. And here we have a speaker tonight. <laughs> David Mahalafi. Mahalafi. Okay. David Mahalafi, labor and education activist for Alderman, Let Our Light Shine campaign. This is meeting number 3,483 of the College of Complexes, and Malalafli's proposed policies include home, a home solar energy program to reduce out of living, uh, I mean to reduce cost of living, create jobs and spur business and spur local business, advocacy for a newly built neighborhood CPS high school, a Chicago flag themed mural corridor with paid summer jobs for youths, and renovation of a local theater presently closed as a non-profit house serving the entire community with kids' music, movies, recent blockbusters, and films and languages like Chinese and Spanish. Let us welcome to the podium with a round, loud, a round of applause, David Malahalafi. All right. Yeah. Yeah. He's got my vote. All right, next. Good luck. He's again, story <laughs> So, um, like a lot of people nowadays, um, I have been trapped and exploited by low wage and short term jobs. But I also fought back. I've been involved in multiple unionization drives, one that brought more than 2,500 workers into AFT-IFT, another one that brought more than 200 workers into Teamsters Local 743. During this time, uh, on my own, because it was the right thing to do, I've also done financial investigative reporting on college student debt and where the money goes. Uh, most notably with that, I went against my own employer, the University of Chicago, and I uncovered that admin got $7.6 in pay raises over five years, even as the school headed towards a credit downgrade. Got that published, and that is absolutely no joke. Crane Chicago Business confirmed my numbers, used them in their reporting on the school's financial mismanagement. Um, this took a lot of passion, this took a lot of dedication, and I would like to bring that same energy to the 11th Ward. Um, you probably all know the 11th Ward, Bridgeport, Canaryville, home of the Dailies. Irish immigrants, Polish immigrants, Lithuanian immigrants, now most recently Chinese immigrants. Just a classic, hard-working neighborhood. A uh, great, great community, though like other places, we're facing our challenges. Uh, there's a lot of empty storefronts. Uh, with kids, for example, you know, there's a lot, there's just not a neighborhood high school there where a lot of kids, especially North End of the Wards, spend over a half hour commuting each way. A lot of people go down to Kelly. And then uh, cost of living is just killing people nowadays. Uh, you, I've met folks, you know, retired, own their own house. One had to come out of retirement and work a part-time minimum wage job in order to afford increased cost of living. Uh, even, you know, there's people, their grandparents bought in Bridgeport, their parents brought in Bridgeport and they simply can't afford it, though they're working as hard as their parents and their grandparents did, and they can't live close together as families. 
even then, within the community, you think that some folks are doing well, and you talk to the people who have one of the nice newly built homes, and they were so careful with their finances, where they arranged it so one parent could stay at home with the kids, that's become increasingly unsustainable, where they're thinking about selling and moving out. And those are the people who we think are doing well in our community. And when you just look with aspect to aspect to aspect of the community, we could be doing more. And that's why if I was alderman, I would be focusing on youth investment and then tackling cost of living. In terms of investing in youth, I would advocate as part of a general program of uplift with existing schools for a newly built high school on the north end of the ward. I would also advocate for more youth activities, especially middle school, high school, critical age when kids get into gangs. We do stuff like bigger scale mural projects, teaching artists, really makes them special for kids that keeps them busy, gives them positive passport, keeps them out of trouble. Um, we could invest publicly in a renovated Remova theater and open it as a nonprofit uh, movie house, a little something for everyone. You can have some kids' movies, second round movies, in Spanish, Chinese, also uh, classic films, have it be a venue where local filmmakers could show stuff. And then the big piece of the puzzle is cost of living. Because cost of living is high and it's just getting worse year after year after year. Um, in terms of where we're at now, there's these really cool home solar programs they're doing in Cleveland, where basically, instead of giving handouts to big developers, you front people money to install home solar, it pays for itself over time, and people save on their utility bills. And that would help a lot of folks out. And then, in terms of moving forward, even since I declared my candidacy, they're talking about another property tax increase. And that last property tax increase has just wreaked havoc in the 11th Ward, like it has all across the city. And that's, so moving forward, we have to honor our pension obligations, but we cannot do it on the backs of working families like we have been. Because working families are just getting stretched thin. Instead, we gotta tax the big banks, and then we gotta tax luxury goods before we ask working families to pay any more. Um, I try to be a positive person and focus on where we can go and what we can do better in a community. And uh, my motto is let our light shine. And really, every community has its challenges, but you want to recognize what's good, bring out the best. This is looking forward with kids. This is giving kids the best with a local high school. This is bringing out the best in them with their creativity with murals. And this is also helping families right now because when they're stretched thin, they can't be the best they can be with solar and with tax and luxury goods, big banks. Um, every generation has its challenges and we got some whoppers right now. Uh, it would be simply an honor to me if my neighbors elected me to office because I would be in there every day busting my butt trying to fight the good fight and make our neighborhood work for the people in it. Thank you. That's it? Yeah. yeah I'm, mm -hmm. I don't talk more than I have to. I always big on efficiency. Yes. Uh, at least another 20 minutes if you want to talk about your campaign or anything. You know, that's, that's, that's basically the basic vision right there. And every one of those points I mentioned can be expanded in different ways. <coughs> and so I'll leave it up to you and to okay. what you're most interested in. Well, how about uh, explaining a little bit more about your points and how you're going to accomplish them once you're elected in office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any given one you're thinking of? Well, first off, the cost of how you're going to do the high school, how you're going to find the funds for the community theater, yep. and uh, just how you're going to allocate some of those tax funds over to these various projects 
that you're wanting to do. Because you not only have that, but you got streets and roads and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is, uh, you know, the TIF fund, which is the mayoral slush fund. <coughs> you got to dial, you got to reform that and dial that back. Because a lot of that just becomes handouts to big developers and it skims money off CPS, uh, skims money out of the park district. So I'd be a member where I'd fight to get that uh, reform, and where you would have still some version of the TIF fund, but not anything like a has been because it's been simply abused. Um, another piece of that with schools, for example, building the new high school, would be cracking down on charters. Because effectively, what charters are is they're profiteering private schools that are living large on public funds in a really obscene way, where effectively you have these profiteering corporations and they set it up where it's a revolving doors of teachers. It's not what our kids deserve. And then based on that saved money, you have these CEOs just lying in their pockets. And that's just an obscene way to funds to crack down and actually invest in our neighborhood schools again. That would be some of the areas where we could save money. As a corollary, and all the families got to do in Chicago if they're having a problem with the cost of living and taxes, they just move about 20 minutes away into one of the su collar suburbs that's booming. You know, and 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 uh, you know, because you go like Bensonville or Addison or even out to McHenry County or my way, they got uh, some affordable housing out there, and they can get jobs. You know, and it, it's sad, but people are doing that because of the challenges we're facing, especially cost of living, schools. But um, my dad said this years ago when I was young. Know, he said, with every institution, every organization, you always want to maintain where you are and build on it and improve. And unfortunately, we slid. Just like I mentioned, you have people with grandparents, parents bought the house on the block, and their current generation can't do it. Yeah, the kid can, you know, the, you know, the kid who now has their own kids can move out to the suburbs, but that's just sad. People who've grown up in our community and deeply love it and are hardworking should be able to afford a home there. And I'd like to give them the same deal that their parents and grandparents had. Because we lost ground as a society with a lot of this stuff. Okay. Yes. I'm old enough to remember 40, 50 years ago when Richard J. Daly was the mayor. Yeah. All of the Illinois board worked for all the people then. How did you you know, Could you repeat the question? Um, he, he was asking whether the award worked for people then 40 years ago. You know, every era they do some things better, they do some things worse. The Daly family has a legacy of public service, and that's not only the mayors, that's also Maggie Daly with After School Matters, which is a beautiful program, which is uh, fully in line with youth investment, which is actually a direction we need more of in this city. Maggie Daly was 110% correct on that. Um, I don't know, they've contributed a lot, and there's a lot we can build on, and there's a lot we can improve on, just like with any generation, with any uh, issues that have been handed off. Okay, who's next? Yeah, Charles? Yeah, David, the bus outside on the street outside here quits at 8, 8.30 or so before the college complexes. And in the 11th Ward, there's no 24-hour bus. Yeah. And the Midway line doesn't run 24 hours either. And even though the station's open, with a customer assistant inside. Do you plan to do anything about public transit? Yeah, thank you very much for bringing up public transit, but especially the Orange Line. I actually think that's an uh, underappreciated uh, area for improvement. Um, so for people living in any given area, you want to maximally invest in public transportation. And then also in terms of the city as a whole, part of the affordable housing crisis is how far people have to live away from work in terms of balances of affordability and commute time. So that can get way the heck out of whack. Um, I think the natural avenues for expansion would be uh, Orange Line, also uh, maybe some of the longer north-south dependent. I would really, really have to look into that crunch data. Um, within every agency uh, also, this is not the entire solution with financing. Well, follow up. Yes. The Trump administration is no longer contributing anything to public transit infrastructure. The city of Chicago contributes exactly nothing for the support of public transit in the city. 
would you be inclined to do something about that? I would fight for anything on the state and federal level where I would join together. This has been a um, question, for example, like uh, with the uh, that Amazon headquarters uh, scam. There's been a question of whether we should fight at the federal level to ban this corporate extortion race to the bottom that's been going on. So I would, that's very, very important for the future of our city and I would work with other aldermen here and other city council members across the country so we can actually ban that corporate type of corporate extortion that just is no good for anyone. Um, so similarly with that, I would also fight for increased funding. Where we are now in terms of our budget, um, I would raise a couple things. Um, I think we need to go after high admin pay. I haven't looked into CTA particularly, but I've had a quick look at the CPS budget and we're easily wasting at least five million a year on overpaid administrators at the, at the central admin. So we would have to tighten our belts like that. And then uh, stuff like Uber and Lyft, um, I think we need to go after that more aggressively because these are legal loopholes that aren't good for workers, not good for the environment, uh, not good for women with incidences of sexual assault, for example, that are happening. Uh, we, need to, we need to go after that and so there's a level playing field because that is draining resources away from CT in a major way. Uh, I'm not much into issues because an elder man gets elected and they are at mayor's mercy. What they can do and what they cannot do. Mm -hmm. Because my elder man, uh, Tom Tunney, he found out he cannot do one simple thing about bus route changing a little bit. So let me ask you this thing. Let me just forget about issues. Talk to me about the strategy of winning the election. Mm -hmm. Because your tough opposition now, show me your arithmetic. What, where are you going to get the votes? Because you are divided community. You got a Chinese, you got Latinos, you got a white people, black Chinese, yep. negligible. So, where, what is your winning strategy? How are you going to win? Because Hillary Clinton had a lots of issues. Trump had a winning strategy. So, what is your winning strategy? Um, so who was asking about my winning strategy? And so you're talking about delivering on promises. No. No? I'm talking about hard numbers. Oh, in terms of how are you going to get 51 percent? Oh. That's a trade secret. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Those are the nuts and bolts. It's a trade secret. I'm working on it. But um no, you know what the thing is, is we could be doing more and people in the community know this. I mean, there's some nice stuff happening. We got some viaduct lighting going up, for example, by 35th Street. We have a couple murals. But on everything like that, you can either continue it, like the viaduct lighting, or like with the murals, you can kick it up a notch and make it look extended youth activities for kids and address the major problem of where I'm, inadequate investment in youth. I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to waste your time. But your formidable opponent against you, and he had a the Chicago best known person backing him and advising him mm -hmm. in your ward. Okay? So how are you going to win before you can do any issue? What is how are you going to get that votes to win? You go door to door, talk about the major unaddressed issues like youth activity, especially cost of living. And in terms of cost of living, for all the for the positive things our current alderman has done, perhaps his biggest single act that's had the biggest impact on the ward was siding with Mayor Emanuel to raise property taxes and institute the garbage tax. And that is part of this failed mentality of nickel and diming working families like that's going to really help our city out and improve it. And I would like to point out with that, uh, four years ago with that property tax increase, people were talking about taxes on luxury goods then, and that was the right thing to do. Instead, our current alderman just went and automatically raised property taxes, and that has just devastated the 11th Ward. And though I respect him on everything, that was the wrong decision, and that is one of the points of clearest contrast. And people get that because they've suffered because of that decision. You have to remember, there are folks in retirement, and they come out of retirement and amount to work part-time at a minimum wage job because of a vote our alderman took.
All right, I, I had gone down just fairly recently to South Bend, Indiana, and I was shocked at how much tolls have increased on like the Skyway mm -hmm. and even the Indiana Toll Road because of the privatization. It's $5.50 now to cross the Skyway when it used to be two fifty before the privatization scam, but yet the road certainly hasn't been maintained as well as it could have been. Can you please comment on what you might do is I know you're running for the 11th Alderman, but is there anything you could do about maybe uh, unprivatizing that toll road or uh, or perhaps maybe uh, getting some of that money into the city? You know, in general, um, that's, a, that's a very, very pertinent issue, and that's probably one of the biggest places we're hemorrhaging money. A lot of it, they try to disguise it. But <laughs> effectively, what we need is you need more efficient public investment, because with public investment, you always have oversight. And when you don't have oversight, what do you get? You get the Aramark scandal in Chicago public schools where they cut staff, they don't give cleaning supplies, and then they try to rig evaluations. They sell you a bill of goods while they're picking your pocket. It's sick. Every place we look where that happens, we got to go after it. And where do you get your, a lot of your data from? Uh, in terms of, this is, an interest, this is an interesting question with public corruption. You effectively have to do a deep research process. Um, one of the common ideas is called participatory diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like the office secretary who always knows what's going on, knows where the bodies are buried. Effectively, you go in and you talk with uh, folks who work at City Hall. I've had conversations with lower level employees who are members of AFSCME. I've met people who work in CPS. Um, and there's rumors. So what you do is you keep your ear to the ground, you gather the rumors. And you have to remember, these people are working people, they're getting screwed too, and a lot of times it just makes them sick. So they're more than happy to share. So you gather the rumors, then based on what you're looking at, you verify, and then you have to figure out oversight systems that would root that out in a cost-effective manner. So, um, so for example, one of the big rumors nowadays is outsourcing is there's a lot of rigged outsourcing going on so this is where you know technically you have the three bids people call them bids and never gets picked up and then it's like sweethearts and it's like it's a sweetheart deal where you know they get the contract and then you know people get a campaign donation so effectively you would have to double check on how that's happening go in see if you can discern any patterns and then figure out an oversight mechanism but it's that the gathering data is a second step. All I have access to now is rumors, but once I'm in office, I would both go after that like a bulldog. And I did that with my own employer at the University of Chicago, where I unveiled those admin pay raises. So I have a proven track record of going after that kind of corruption, and I would do so here now. Are you still employed at the University of Chicago? You know, lucky I had a good, I had some good mid-level managers. I worked teaching freshman writing. And uh, they kept me on. Now, now I work in elder care. Okay. Are you familiar with the campaign that uh, Alexandra ran in New York to beat that incumbent Democrat that was next in line for Nancy Pelosi's? Uh, she's mm -hmm. a 28-year-old Social Democrat, and she it was a 50-point swing in her favor in the last couple of weeks because she was talking about things that help people. Have you, have you studied her campaign at all yet or seen what, what happened in New York? Yeah, I'm roughly familiar with her campaign. Um, you could do the same thing here. I, yeah, I, 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 I see broad similarities, for example, because we're both living in this current economy, and this current economy is brutal. No matter how hard you try, it's like the decks are stacked against you. So I, I see that, and then uh, the proposal she has make a lot of sense. So at the federal level, a federal jobs guarantee. I was so glad to see her do that. I've been saying that for years now. So for example, uh, I've worked as many as three to four jobs a year, sometimes as many as three or four jobs at a time, because they're all part-time, on-call, that kind of nonsense, because of legal loopholes. Um, and I, I've, I've been through that. I've seen a lot of people go through that myself, and I said, you know, why can't we have a civilian conservation corps again? If you had a civilian conservation corps where you were guaranteed to show up and you had a fair wage, people would be lined up out the block to avoid this uber nonsense, to avoid, you know, like these little uh, mechanical turf jobs to get over the internet. Um, I was so happy 
she did uh, she proposed that she's a, a advocate of that and I'm I'm there with those same issues I'd be happy to work with any official like herself with the same values well the lesson is people turn out in droves to vote for somebody that wants to actually help working people I think yeah I yeah. would agree with that yeah. I would agree with that totally yeah. it works in America you're not going to be you know uh, not, not going to be an outlier, you know, people will vote for you. If you've talked about those things and you want to do that, when you get involved. Maybe, maybe. You know, I'm just thinking that, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I wonder what the people uh, who represent Manhattan look like. You know, this comes up a lot, you know, people say Ron wants another Manhattan where there's this glassy center of the city and everyone else commutes in an hour to work at minimum wage shops serving them. I wonder what kind of policies and advocacies you see getting out there. Because you know, you'd like to think that it's, you know, helping working people, but I honestly wonder if that would work in every district. I'm just thinking out loud here. Yes? Are you actually on the ballot? Uh, no, this is until late August. Yep, I'm, I'm out here a uh, heck of ways ahead of time, which is also, you know, the farther out you got, the more work you can do, which is also how you can be more plausible a candidate. So, um, my question is, can you comment on the system to get on the ballot mm. and what you're doing get on the ballot because I understand it's very, very challenging. You basically, ballot qualification is one of the biggest ways that democracy is manipulated to keep people in power in power. Uh, at this point, you gotta hire a lawyer and make sure you do everything to a T, otherwise you get knocked off. But you'll still get, you're still, you're gonna get challenged, period. Yep, uh, I've already done sufficient fundraising. I already have a lawyer who's working with me right now. And so that'll continue. Unfortunately, uh, probably that will be a huge expense for my campaign comparatively. I'm not going to get the corporate donors. I don't even want them. If they want to give me money, I'd say no. But uh, yeah, if that's just the way it is. That's one of the way the system's rigged. Yes, Charles. Okay. David, uh, you spoke a lot about youth investment programs, but I'm a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our fellow senior citizens, much as we like youth investment, there are things of senior nutrition issues, housing issues, transportation issues. Uh, do you plan to do anything on senior investment? Um, so the solar program, like I've mentioned, would uh, help people with cost of living. That's one of the big things that's really impacting seniors right now. And that's why I try to have that front and center on my campaign and in my conversations with folks. Um, and I say youth investment because that's positive and I try to be a positive person, but implicitly that's anti-crime. And within a multi-pronged anti-crime approach, that's the area where we're not doing quite enough and that's where we can get more bang for your buck. So even though it's youth investment, there's dividends to the greater community in terms of community safety and that benefits seniors as well. So every senior homeowner gets a free solar uh, the way you would the way you would do this is effect is uh, there's different ways you set up the program. Uh, the financial sense of the solar is technology has in, has improved so much the past like three to five years. Home solar is already cost effective as far north over 20 years warranty, but you got to afford the initial installation, which a lot of folks can't. So what you would do is instead of giving handouts to the big developers, you would front people uh, money to install home solar for free. It would pay for itself in time. Every month, you know, from then on after installation, they would have part go in their pocket, part pay back the city, and roll forward. Um, it wouldn't help out everyone uh, directly. So for example, maybe you have shade on your roof, maybe it's a bad roof, but the program pays for itself. It helps people out, why not? Uh, but there are indirect dividends. Uh, so for example, uh, because people would have extra money, a big uh, part of the problem right now with empty storefronts is that a lot of folks just don't have extra money to spend. So if you put an extra 40 to 50 bucks in their pocket every month, people would go out for a date night, they'd buy some stuff for their kids, and that would be a shot in the arm with the local economy. And then that, of course, would lead to increased prosperity. Uh, it also gets a lot of crap out of the air. So for folks who have asthma or on oxygen tanks and stuff, so depending on particular health issues people might have, that would be a bonus there. Um, 
Speaker. Uh, the announcement for this meeting mentioned a lot of good ideas you had for the ward, but um, I'm not sure you summarized them all in, in your talk. Is there anything else that uh, you would um, have, you plan to do? Any other uh, mm. ideas that you didn't mention so far? You covered some that I figured entirely just now, but. You know, um, there's there's citywide issues, and then there is also um, there's citywide issues. Then there are extremely local issues. In terms of citywide issues, there's some good legislation on the uh, table to dial back on call jobs. So, for example, you would have jobs guaranteed a work uh, a working schedule one to two weeks out ahead of time. That might sound weird. But a lot of these big retailers, Target and whatnot, they schedule by phone, their schedule's always shift in, and it just wreaks havoc on families. You don't know how much your income is, you can't arrange for childcare. And that's a huge under-acknowledged problem. Um, I wouldn't be supportive of that legislation, and I'd like to figure out what else we could do to get that passed. The Progressive Caucus already has that on the table. Um, in terms of CPD, um, depending on the state of affairs, there's questions about like so the level of civilian oversight. Um, it's clear, what I've learned from the community is everyone knows there's a problem, but we don't have quite the right answer yet. And I think there are consensus solutions to these problems, but it's involved, it would involve pieces of different uh, elements on the table, also more streamlining of bureaucracy. And so depending uh, on the, whether the state of reform issues, if anything is passed before I take office, or if it's still on the table, or if their issues are still live when I take office, I'd like to take an active role in that to try to figure out consensus solutions that benefit community safety and that ensure speed due process. Since you uh, don't have much money, do you have a group of volunteers that would knock on doors? And Things of that nature. Yes. Yep. Um, I've been uh, I've been active in uh, multiple unionization campaigns, and so for example, like when I did initial fundraising, I was able to get over 165 small donors. When I did my debut event, I had I'm mean, trying to think. It was on a weekday. We had around like eight people going, and we did some flyer blitzes in part of the ward. Since then, I've actually used volunteers not to do door to door for their first round of uh, knock in the ward because I've been kind of tucked away doing freelance writing and doing workplace campaigns, so people don't necessarily always know my face over the ward. So right now, it's just me knocking doors, but that's going to scale up, uh, and we can do that at any time. We have a lot of people running for mayor. Do you have any preferences? Um, I will work with whoever is in office to accomplish the most I can for the 11th Ward and for the city. Um, I try to keep it on the issues. I try to keep personality politics out of that. I would like to say I'm very disappointed in how uh, Mayor Emanuel has approached taxation and that property tax increase, the garbage tax increase, which Alderman Daly Thompson voted for has just wreaked havoc on the community. Um, I'm willing to work with whoever's in office. How can people get a hold of you? Do you have a website, a Facebook page? Yep, uh, I'm on Twitter. I throw up some, I have a coordinated Facebook group. I also have, uh, I also have uh, a website that uh, has a lot of the information. And then I have flyers I can hand out, which has, uh, email and uh, phone, and I'll distribute the flyers after Okay. This. All right. Sure. Yes, uh, David, you said you you don't like the increase in property tax. You don't like the garbage, garbage collection fees. But so those costs of government don't disappear. <laughs> what is your alternative source of funding to bring in finances for the city so it can pay its bills. Yep. Um, this is basically a lot of the well off from paying their fair share in taxes and there's multiple ways you can attack that to get more revenue. Um, this would be yacht dockage taxes. This was discussed four years ago. Carlos Rosa, for example, said, let's, you know, let's see how much money we can derive from that. 
before we talk about a property tax increase, which is exactly the right approach. Well, we have a lot of the yachts uh, docked out, like in Lake Michigan on the waterfront. Uh, the 35th Street, I think they're all for except 35th Street for a number of reasons. Okay. And so you would basically try to increase dockage fees, see how much that gets you. There's waiting lists. It's not like they're all gonna, you know, go, you know, go across the lake or something like that. All they gotta do is go to Waukegan Harbor. So you want to increase user fees? Yes, for example, for the wealthy, for the wealthy. And in terms of this, um, to be honest, a lot of these uh, yacht people, they like to be partying up in the metropolis. You know, they they, they cruise around Lake Michigan all day, then they cut, they dock here, have a forty dollar entree an $18 craft cocktail, and they're, they're not going to be doing that in one Keegan. So they'd eat up the uh, user fees. Uh, so anyway, so the, the, to be honest, that was plausible there. In terms of other sources of revenue, um, this there are some really, really good ideas about uh, vacant foreclosed property taxes. So, you know, the big banks, they just did all that awful financial speculation uh, that, you know, a lot of people lost their homes. A lot of times they're closed, they're not taken care of. There's proposals where you could effectively tax them. So that's a win-win situation because then this is property. The property is property. It's here. And you either charge the big banks for holding it vacant or that financial motivation makes them sell the rent, which increases housing stock, which helps with cost of living and affordability. That, that would be that would be another major source as well. And then if we got home rule, we'd have to get that change at the state level. Um, we really should have a uh, financial speculation tax, and that is very plausible. Um, like Tom Tresser's Chicago Not Broke's um, book says very clearly that because of uh, internet infrastructure and how tightly tied financial speculation is to internet infrastructure and how that's historically been associated with Chicago, can tax financial speculation, they're not going to redo the entire router system, say, you know, like a penny or a nickel a trade. And that, meanwhile, you'd get a ton of revenue off of that. You got tax? All right. Um, no, you would eventually tax online trading. A lot of stuff, you know, like the Chicago Board of Trade, that went from physical trading to online rapid uh, trade, rapid trading. That's done, uh, you know, through the internet. That all goes through routers, which have been built up here because it basically piggybacked off of where the physical location was, and so they're kind of stuck here with us. They're doing financial speculation, which we should have less of. So why not make the money we can? And you make some money, you discourage financial speculation. Win win. Okay. You spoke of dockage fees. Yeah. Now, most of the, 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 uh, the docking space in the municipal harbors, that's not owned by the city of Chicago, but by the Chicago Park District. Wouldn't they be the ones collecting the docking fees? And they have their own authority to raise property taxes. Mm -hmm. And there's also like uh, there's also some private contracts, and there would have to go through with the city's legal department to figure be very very smart about how we set that up in order to collect. And that's unfortunately we've uh, inherited a lot of these bum, you know, uh, private profiteering deals, just like with parking meters that have unfortunately are keeping us in the hole, keep us shackled right now, you know, in terms of this stuff because we're just paying through the nose to these private companies. We'd have to set that up legally. What the good people in a current mayor's government? Are there any good people there? Who are they? You know, there are good people everywhere. The question is, what kind of institutions do you set up? Do you encourage good behavior or bad behavior? And this is a very important point. Thank you for raising this. When we look at social psychology, Actually, if you're looking for something to read, there's this great article, uh, Killing Conscience, by Lynn Sweet. She's a Cornell law professor. And we have this idea, it's all financial incentives. You give financial incentives, you create job performance. She says, you know, this is actually not in accordance with research. When you look at people, about 5% of people are probably selfless. Another 5% of people are sociopaths. Everyone else, there's environmental cues. Do they act selflessly or do they act selfishly? And when you do this, where you set up these obscene financial incentives, you actually create wider incidences of sociopathy in a greater society. And unfortunately, I think a lot of our central administration throughout city government, we've been incentivizing sociopathy. Uh, this is like, uh, you know, this is uh, CPS is a perfect example of that, where, you know, a lot of these obscene, uh, for the central administrators, their pay is simply too high 
And what you do is you attract the wrong kind of people who only want to line your pockets. So for example, uh, that contract scandal, uh, Barbara Bird Bennett, is that? Yeah. Yes, yes, Barbara Bird Bennett. That is normal behavior. Because when you pay that kind of money, you're not attracting the selfless person. That's the people in the CPS classrooms. You're attacking this kind of like wheeler, dealer, nice suitor person who's only out to line their pockets. Of course, they're going to do sweetheart deal contracts. So actually, if you dialed back a lot of pay in central administration, you know, this would be like CPS, for example, or places in the city government, you would actually attract a better type of person and get better job performance and save money to boot. So that's actually a very important subtle point. Um, and we could reform our institutions to get to, so that not only the people who are there could do, could do uh, continue doing their jobs, the good people, but then the people who are on the edge, they might be incentivized to do, you know, to act more selflessly. And of course, when you have turnover with lower pay, you know, decent pay, solid pay, you would uh, attract a better kind of person into the job. Yes? Um, question, sort of a pronged approach. Two sources of revenue we're talking about. What is your opinion legalizing marijuana, controlling, taking that revenue, and also, which has been talked about, a casino for the city to supplement gain income on that. So those are the two questions, and just to get your opinion on both. Uh, casinos, no, there's too much social costs. Unless there was research talking about lost revenue to Indiana, for example, my, my gut inclination would be no, but we would have to really carefully look into the uh, casinos because it's just too, you just, you get money on paper, but you're losing money elsewhere through bankruptcies, through the social evils that occur. Um, marijuana, yes, but we have to be a lot more cautious. So for example, uh, there's been mistakes with environmental ills because of uh, pesticide use. And that's been, that's been surfacing, where for example, there wasn't quite enough, we weren't aware of like how that would go down. So we have to look at the current experiments that are going on, learn from them and do that. So yes, in the future, maybe now, but we need to double check on how those programs are run so it's response, so they're run responsibly. So, you know, my gut, my no. I think that's a quick fix. I think that I think that's a quick fix. Uh, I like how you're talking about helping out people who need more help and shifting some of the burden to the rich. But there are also a lot of people in Chicago who are literally worried that Chicago is going to be another Detroit because of this massive budget deficit um, uh, and these debt obligations. So how do you how do you deal with that? How do you how do you stop this habit of kicking the can down the road and saying, you know, the longer we do it, the bigger loans we have to take out to, to carry it on. Mm -hmm. You have to address it. How would you address that? Yeah, it's an un, it's an unfortunate financial situation that we've inherited. Um, moving forward, you have to honor your pension obligations. This is where we look into alternate revenue sources. And then after that, there might be a time where we could look at smaller tax increases, um, but only after we look at luxury goods tax and big banks. So for example, um, the pop tax issue was very, very uh, telling. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the money for most people. It was about the feeling of nickel and dimed. And I think people's frustrations onto a rigged system got projected onto the pop tax. What's interesting to me is I know people in the community who talked about this, they hated the pop tax. And I said, okay, how would you feel if, you know, because we crunch numbers, we were responsible. And to balance our budget, we had to do a 5,000 a year vacant property tax to Citibank and Chase yeah. and a five cent pop tax. Would that be okay then? And they said, yes. And to me, that's a telling response. The projection onto that was about the rig deal. And maybe you could have some legislation where you could have slight increases you know, in other areas. But that's where you have to go after big banks, slugs are good first, and then see where you are. And I think if you did that, people would trust you enough. They know your heart was in the right place. They would accept that you've inherited a bad situation, and they would be willing to do things like, you know, like a nickel pop. Pension problem is a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, when pensions were first set up, they thought uh, very few people would live past 70. <coughs> now a lot of people are living 85, 90, even past 100. Mm -hmm. 
interest rates have gone down. Sooner or later, uh, all of these things are going to have to be canceled and we're going to have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you see in the future with this? There's two aspects to the pension problem, and there's the direct issue of the pension problem, uh, of funding pensions for that in generation of workers. Uh, younger generations, unfortunately, we've lost ground there, and I think it's a larger social security problem, a larger social security solvency problem. And this is where we need massive federal programs uh, in terms of quality of life through old age that are disconnected from the individual employer. This is like, for example, different issues that Ocasio-Cortez has been raising, where we need to get our values in line. We need to crack down on these profiteers and financial speculators who have not only been not paying their fair share, but then rigging the system even more so they can steal even more. We need to crack down on that and invest in larger social programs. Yes. We have a real crisis in this country as far as media. Uh, for example, you mentioned the Amazon headquarters uh, live in Chicago. Uh, putting forward to have Amazon headquarters come to Chicago and how it's an example of corporate extortion. I think a lot of times uh, when these issues come up, uh, as far as candidates or whether it's a referendum on the ballot, People don't know what they don't know because the corporate media isn't going to tell them Amazon is a modern day plantation because it's in their interest to encourage more privatization, more corporatization. So, how would you work with the non corporate media sources in the Chicagoland area to let the people know that they should be empowered with the truth through non corporate media sources? This, that's a very, very complicated question and there's a number of levels to it. There's freedom of speech, freedom of press. There is media literacy and a healthy functioning democracy. And then there's also the camp, you know, the issue of like uh, finance, distinct speech at the individual campaign level. Um, Overall, as a country, we have to be very, very wary of any restrictions of free speech because sooner or later they can be manipulated into oppressing minority speech, uh, including which, of course, a lot of times is health, the speech that's uh, the most incisive and the uh, healthiest for the democracy. In terms of corporate media and media with agendas, There seems to be a generational turnover that I've observed where millennials on down are just incredibly savvy mm -hmm. about media and media agendas in ways that older generations are not. On the whole, on the whole. In every generation there's people who are smart, every generation there's people who don't get it. But overall I think they've grown up with the internet and they see the agenda. Um, it was very, very fascinating to me to see uh, with the Parkland students. People have been talking about the NRA for years and how it's had an unhealthy effect. They were the ones who cut through the BS and said basically the NRA sells guns for the gun lobby. Who else has said that that directly? That point has been made, but who else has said that directly? You know who did? It's a kid who's still in high school. And I think that's very hopeful in terms of media literacy. So yeah, yeah, we should worry about that, but I think in some sense generational shift will uh, solve that. And in terms of like my own individual campaign, I'm out here early, I'm talking to folks. I'm talking to folks about the main major problems, there's not gonna be movement on that. And hopefully we'll build enough conversations, enough density, where I'll be able to be the next public servant for the 11th Ward, and be working in there every day trying to deliver. Are people on the eleventh wall satisfied with their current elder man? And second thing is that what can you improve on him? What? How can you improve on current elder man mm -hmm. to to satisfy your your wall? You know, I mean, it's 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 mixed. 
there's some good stuff that's happened in permits on time, paving gets done, he's done some enough stuff with viaduct lighting, but in general there just hasn't been that vision uh, in terms of more. So for example, they did a mural on 35th Street, they're doing one down in Canaryville now for Canaryville Vets. It's nice, but it's like a one-day community event where kids come in and whitewash it. We have a lot of artists in the community. There's cool programs like One Summer Chicago that run activities for kids, and that's part of youth investment. Why can't we have that same mural budget and have it pay teaching artists and have kids make the murals a longer-term activity? For the given use of money, you could be having a lot more uh, positive community effects. So that would be one area we could do better. Um, in term, and then I think the biggest area of difference would be cost of living. And that's where we could help people out right now with the home solar. And that's also where we need to look to other sources of revenue. Because uh, in that area, I do think, even though for all the good he's done, the current alderman uh, side with Mayor Emanuel on this uh, wrong proposal to just shake down working people even more to solve our revenue problems. You mentioned solar. Uh, has there been any talk about the, the home weatherization programs that are run in other cities? You know, helping, uh, that, that's a quicker payback than even solar. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Yeah, uh, yeah so a lot of times, yeah, we would try to pick it back off that. It would provide a lot of new jobs, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally. Come of the Yeah, yeah. Yep, there's existing programs like that. You would try to uh, set the program in a really uh, careful way where people would also do home weatherization at the same time. My point is that present programs aren't big enough to really uh, provide a lot mm. of jobs. You know, they are programs, but they could be scaled up five, six, eight times as big mm -hmm. citywide, and then the city would benefit with uh, you know, energy, the energy efficiency across the board. Save a lot of money for everybody. Mm. You know, I thought I thought about this. It might be worth it um, for the different program. There's different ways you set it up. There's always the question of what criteria you use, like where to draw, like who qualifies, what not, you know, who doesn't on what basis. Um, we could use some of the. Uh, there's a lot of uh, resourcing of. Uh, like Brendan Riley has talked about the. Uh, what's that new financial analysis office where they're going to do. Uh, the policy effects for uh, the financial effects of different policies. There's, they're like basically setting up more personnel in City Hall to check financial effects. We could crunch numbers at a later point in time, how much to put into solar, how much to put into energy efficiency. And then you would have to have community conversations about qualifies for the programs anyways. And we could have that conversation in the community. But that'd be something that's totally part of that, it would make a lot of sense. I've had, I've had people raise that myself. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people. I've had at least, like, I've met at least 12 to 14 people who've done, uh, who've looked into energy efficiency and solar. Uh, and that we've described in terms of the estimates they got, whether it made sense for them. So thank you for raising it. Okay. I'd like to know, you know, you bring up a lot of good ideas, but corruption has been around for generations, including going back to New York City when they had the infamous Thomas Nast cartoons detailing political corruption. And what happens? You get rid of one administration, you get another one come in, and they get just as corrupt. How are you going to bring a more permanent solution to the problem, or is it just going to be another temporary Band-Aid type thing where somebody else comes in and figures out another way to do it? You know, I, I agree. It's like a... I agree. Oh. There we go. It's just, okay. I agree it's, like a, it's almost like a whack-a-mole. Yeah. yeah. And you just got to keep whacking the moles. And this is like where, you know, the outsourcing it has become a, a huge source of like corruption it seems nowadays. You have to go after that. Overall, though, I would like to flag that um, we have made improvements in this. As someone who had worked in higher education, it's the Wild West and uh, the lack of uh, professionalism, accountability, transparency is nightmarish. Uh, I've dealt with people in uh, city government, state, federal government, different areas, whether we're running for government, just as a citizen, doing research and writing. And um, I don't think we appreciate quite enough the important work that's done by, for example, inspector generals. Right. Um, and higher educate, this is something I've thought of, I'd like to write about at some point. I'm still gathering thoughts about this. Um, higher education could benefit from an inspector general 
as well as different offices uh, that could uh, do an investigate external legal investigations for discrimination if you accept federal funds. So for example, there's a lot of uh, tension with Title IX and sexual assault, and our current systems are inadequate because a lot of it's left up to the school. And effectively, I think you need an inspector general type system uh, so that schools accept federal funds do not discriminate. And so you also have like accountability, transparency in uh, federally funded education and research. I'd also like to get your opinion of the Better Government Association and the public radio station on WBEZ that uncovers a lot of the scandals. Mm. Or are you familiar with them? I, the acronym rings a bell. I've probably read their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm all for people uncovering scandals. You learn, you know, you, 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 you learn not only scandal, you learn how stuff works. You keep your eye open for what's wrong where. Where? Okay. Yes. Uh, the Amtrak is renovating the Union Station, and all of the tracks and trains that enter Union Station pass through the ward. Are you have any concept of establishing a high-speed rail as found in other cities to augment this transportation headquarters in the ward? New York? Yeah, a lot of that is provide jobs for the people. Yeah, a lot of that's federal funding. So, for example, uh, the big Amtrak expansion that didn't happen was uh, from Milwaukee to Madison under Scott Walker, where he tanked that for uh, perverse ideological reasons. Um, I'm a fan of that type of investment. Um, in terms of local transport, and I'd advocate for that so we can secure those funds at the federal level. In terms of locally, in terms of expansion of transit, um, there's the targeted issues you've raised, like for example, running the orange line longer, which is a great idea that people don't talk enough about. Um, there's also the ideas kicking around where you could convert the south shoreline and have that run every 10, 15 minutes and would effectively like uh, try to transfer that over from Metra to CTA to have it run more like a subway car. Yeah, um, that's cost that's of- That's the crackpot, Steve. It's the gray line. That's nuts. I'm sorry, Bill. That's um, nutty. One okay, four, with the hi, Charlie. One four, Charlie. Sorry, that is a nuts. Hell, no, no, no. They didn't bar that guy even from talking about it. Um, right. Really? Um, yeah. Is that because of doability in terms of metro CTA? Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, save it for the rebuttal, Charlie. Save it for the rebuttal, Charlie. In terms, in terms right, of. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Yeah. In terms of. Serving the community, just especially southwest sides, people have to commute a long time to their jobs, Why and that would be cost effective to convert. Finish the orange line. That's all you have to do. It's never been finished. One uh, that's in a different time direction time. of the community in terms of serving South Shore along the lake. Existing CTA never been finished. Let the man speak, Charlie. Let the man speak, Charlie. They the line a connector. That gray line is nutty. And you know the their high speed train. The thing it's is, is federal stuff. Baloney. Well, Charlie, you're, uh, you're, the, you're, you're actually violating our own laws well, here, one fool at a time. <laughs> so <laughs> quit <laughs> engaging in Hippocratic behavior and let's let the speaker speak. But the thing is, let's let the speaker speak. There's levels of doability and there's reasons projects can't move forward. And uh, you got to pay attention to what seems like a good idea and what's holding it back. And maybe there'll be a couple different political situation five, ten years down where it'd be easier to integrate Metro into CTA. Just because you know you have a lot of good ideas doesn't mean you can work on any one at any given time because it just might not be propitious. We have slow zones yeah. and you gotta do a crackpot scheme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's probably time to go rebuttals. Mm -hmm. What? Okay. Can you tell us more about your um, plans to renovate the theater and get it going again? Well, what's the name of the theater? Uh, this is the Remova Theater. It's around 35th and Halstead. Uh, really cool space. Uh, interiors pretty gutted. Uh, min the lowest renovation estimate I've heard is 12 million. You say wow. However, the thing is, is that means a lot to a lot of people. And right now, we're thinking, you know, they're all thinking we'll have some private developer come in and you're going to give all these subsidies and then they'll reopen. But really, they'll probably reopen. It's like a niche venue with $75 tickets. Uh, money would be there. They just gave uh, from TIF funds 
10 million to Congress the year. Is that the one? People I'm within the ward, by the way, people within the, uh, the ward. Yep. Uh, no, no, but also Congress Theater on Milwaukee. They just got $10 million in TIF to do a renovation on Congress Theater outside on the borders of Logan Square. They also just announced Yeah. Yeah, I've been looked into buying it and on that. But so, for example, you know, they got $10 million there. Um, for people who've been in Bridgeport lately, they uh, did a streetscape between 35th and 31st, and they redid Morgan Street. That infrastructure project cost $4 million. So when you think about that, yeah, $12 million is a lot of money, but they're getting 10 million for the Congress Theater. We spent 4 million there. And you ask people, and you say, would you rather have that streetscape or would you rather go a third of the way to renovating the Remova? And most, not all, say renovate. But the key thing is for what? And I think we just gotta give up these ideas that these private developers are gonna save us in every single instance. With the Remova, when you pay that much money instead of paying through the nose to a private developer who will open up a niche venue with $75 tickets, why don't you reopen it, keep it simple, and keep it cheap? Um, I think a great example of this would be a National Museum of Mexican Art, where it was community-based, and then uh, it's there in Pilsen, and it's just a, uh, just a gem. And I wonder if you could have something like that that you could develop as a nonprofit <laughs> link into the city. And uh, if you had it as public, uh, as a public venue, not only could you keep it cheap, but you would have more control. And that's where you could do instead of having a niche venue, you could have some for everyone. People want to have something they can walk with to you know, take their kids to see. They want to be able to see a second run movie for a date night. Um, a lot of people in the community speak Spanish and Chinese. If you were able to show movie, the different movies, people would turn out for that. Uh, and that would make the, that would make sense, and there would be buy-in from every corner of the ward, and so not only would it be cheaper, more cost-effective, it would meet community needs a lot more. Okay. You get a rock and a roll call. Yeah. No. And depending on the state of the stage, you would want you of course no 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 of course you would want to make sure if if you can at all you would have a stage where it could also do like you know performances, music performance, dance theater. Is it the uh, the business district for the 11th ward? Is Halstead from well, not County University? Uh, you have University Village, right? Yeah. So that's mainly the business district. I ride my bike down there. It's, yeah. Uh, Halstead, pretty much the whole. I can't think of any other business district. Why, why does it have? Why do you think the business district is not as? Uh, um, I guess you don't have the density. There's a couple. Yeah. There's a couple things happening while we're having empty storefronts. A big thing, and uh, Alderman Daly Thompson and I are in complete agreement on this. When you look into this, uh, stuff like Amazon has just completely gutted a lot of brick and mortar retail. Um, and so I think we have to reset our expectations where you can't go back to the way we were pre Amazon. Even though you know, we can crack down on Amazon because they, you know, they do a lot of taxes Amazon. and stuff. Like yeah, I don't know. No, no, but I mean, just that, that's, a big, that's a big reason for the brick and mortar. Um, in terms of revivifying the streetscape, I think part of it too is a lot of times people are just stretched in nowadays. Well, renovating that theater is really nice. What about the vacant grocery store that's been shut down for about three years, a block away from Put there? Put an Aldi in there, man. Wouldn't that be a little more a priority? Uh, how many supermarkets are there in the world? <laughs> There's, you know, there's Cermac up there, then you go fair play down at the other end and stuff. That's 47. Um, I think That's in general, in general, and this is an area where Alderman Daly Thompson and I agree is, there's specific business needs, but once you say you need this type of business, you get into this uh, subsidy corporate and extortion mentality, yes. and you pay through, like, you pay just a lot of millions, and then what you get at the end. And so that's where you're better off for any given development money. You're better putting money in people's pockets and letting that be a more organic process where they themselves were to decide where to go and different businesses would thrive. Is there all the money down there? Every year. We're going to get a certain amount of money every year. We're not having a I'll give a
I know I, I hear I hear a couple questions. There's a question of the sick business, and I think those kinds of questions get quickly into the corporate subsidy stuff, which is we're very yeah, away from. In terms of in terms of the storefront space, this is where we need to have more creative ideas. For example, like the artist studio stuff, which would probably work better Instead for the smaller the storefront. You're going to put in an artist for some of the smaller businesses, that one probably won't work as much. But I think I think you could try to encourage that type of redevelopment by landlords. It, you know, it basically would increase housing stock right. a little bit, take pressure off of rentals. It would be, you know, people would have the, their stuff up in front, okay. provide some vibrancy on the street. Does anybody have any more questions at this point? And if it's okay with Charlie, can we go into the rebuttal period now? Okay. All right. Uh, Andy, you want to transition us? To, um, never mind. Why don't you go ahead and transition us to rebuttals, if you don't mind? Thank you. Okay. Thank our speaker tonight. Yeah. Can, can we uh, give our speaker a hand? Yeah. Uh, we, we we generally speak uh, allow our speakers about four minutes to rebut. Okay. We might go to five tonight because we got a little more time. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. But so, you'll get the last word. So who wants, who wants yeah. to? Uh, who wants to? How many? Speak or say something. Can I see a show of hands? I got something. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. We'll go five minutes, you think? Okay, we'll do five minutes. And uh, we'll start right now. Who wants to be first? All right, we got somebody to get up there for rebuttal. I'll uh. I'll get it taken care of. Oh, I see what happened. I notice his love for the his word and job, and I appreciate his knowledge on issues which he thinks are important. And uh, I wish he had a strategy for winning. What what uh, bothers me is that no, before I go there. Let me take care of New York City. Every everybody should understand one thing about New York City, <laughs> London, Paris, Stockholm, Frankfurt, Bombay. Is that these are the city that driving the world? New York City, the country and the world's best people, best brain, most motivated. Most talented people come there. Most beautiful people come there. New York City is like a, like a, compared to Chicago, it's like a big machine humming there. And everybody is uh, contributing. There is nothing like Manhattan in the whole world. Because it, and do you know something? It produces. It creates innovation. So everybody should take two from that not thinking. Anyway, coming back to the Chicago. The, and all this admiration, you know, do you know what, what I kept on kept on feeling in my mind? Hillary Clinton is everywhere. And nobody noticed Donald Trump. 
you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are talking lots of things that Hillary Clinton was talking about. Okay? But Donald Trump had a winning strategy. He didn't give a damn about anything. He said, I'm going to do the biggest thing ever. <laughs> and it worked for him. Okay? And there is something, it's not only here in America. It work in India. Okay? It work in Poland. Okay? It's working, lots of places, it work in Italy. Lots of places are working it. So people, maybe, may, maybe, maybe it's an older man thing is different. But if, if I'm running for an older man, then I'm going to worry about what my current elder man is doing. Is he doing good job, <laughs> not good job? I go to talk to people and he say, what would you like to change? What would you like, what you don't like? What, what can I, how can I do better? Maybe, 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 maybe that, 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 that lady in a New York City, the Spanish lady in New York City did. And that's fine. If you are doing that, and if you are learning, and what John Walker or who was this governor, guy and governor, he did the walking thing. Remember, remember? Yeah, you know, probably. yeah. I mean, I mean, probably because because you 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 twenty five percent Chinese population, and do you know something? I think it's going to be very very hard for you to knock them down from the from the daily guy because do you know something? They, they are not so damn business oriented. They have problem. They can call up, call up the current elder man and get the thing done. And you, you, you probably may not be able to because you may not have their connections. Okay? If they have, they have problems, okay, they'll be taken care of one, two, three. Okay? You can talk about developing and everything and artists and everything. Okay? Average less. I doubt average less. I'm scared. They want their garbage picked up, they, they want uh, their injection to come, their water to come, you know, when water, whatever it is, and they have a problem, the problem, call Alderman's office, and Alderman solve the problem. Okay? That, that's what it is. Okay? And do something I know. I can, I can I see this. Most Alderman have no power. Maybe, maybe there, there are uh, 10, 10 Alderman who have power and who have been there forever. They have the power. And let's talk about what you what you have to you have to know what you can do and what you cannot do. And we, we, we can we can talk about details, everything, how it's done and mechanics and, and what is in and out like Hillary Clinton doing. Doesn't work anymore. People want simple, simple way of saying things and a simple solution and getting things done. Okay? You may you may know everything about it. A stockyard, or you may know everything about every single one. Doesn't matter. And we don't think people of Chicago are not unhappy right now. I don't think they are unhappy. Unemployment rate is low. You know, when I see I see blacks working on the north side. Lots of lots of black young people working. I see everywhere. Okay. And I, I mean, me, mayor is doing as good as it's possible. Even though you know I'm a little bias against against Jewish guy, but I I got to tell you he's doing good job, and I voted for him twice. <laughs> Okay, and and and, uh, and I think go governor's race. Okay, okay, and it is working. Okay, so you you can figure it out. You have a tough job, and I don't think you are that serious about the job. Thank you. Hi. Okay. All right, Dan. Call the order. All right. All right. Right. Remember, five minutes of I didn't see any of you people down at the march today at Daly Plaza. I was there. No, you weren't. March for Russians? March for immigrants, supporting our immigrants. My mother was an immigrant. So there, there you are. So, uh, we're all immigrants. No, we're not. We're half immigrants. Oh. All right, so I got a poem with today. It's called As We Were Marching by Aharon Shabtai, probably from a Arab country, like Iraq. As We Were Marching, two days ago in Rafia, nine Arabs were killed. Yesterday, six were killed in Hebron, and today, just two. Last year, as we were marching from Schenken Street in Tel Aviv, a man on a motorcycle shouted toward us, death to the Arabs. That's what he said. 
At the corner of Labor, opposite the Brazil Market, next to Brown's Butcher Shop, and at the corner of Begrashov, just to the Arabs. For a full year, this poem was lying on the sidewalk along King George Street, and today I lift it up and compose its final line. Life to the Arabs. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. I got another poem, Jim. I know you're dying to hear it. I can't wait. Come on, let's have it. All right, all right. All right. It's called, I came here tonight. Called Rosh Hashanah by Acharon Shabtai. I remember him. He's still alive, I think. Even after the murder of the child Muhammad on Rosh Hashanah, the paper didn't go black. In the same water in which the snipers wash their uniforms, I prepare my pasta, and over it pour olive oil, in which I brown pine nuts, which I cook for two minutes with dried tomatoes, crushed garlic, and a tablespoon of basil. As I eat, the learned minister of foreign affairs and public security appears on the screen, and when he's done, I write this poem. For that, for that's how it always, it's always been. The murderers murder, the intellectuals make it palatable, and the poet sings. Thank you. Uh, so I'm curious, how, how many people here would support a tax on uh, all the rich voters in Chicago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them okay. um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a, 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 a not an unexpected response for people who uh, don't understand the voting system. The, the problem with that approach most voters are middle class. They're not guys who just bought a quarter million dollar yacht. <laughs> They're guys that have uh, put five or ten thousand dollars into a boat that's that's ten or twenty years old and they spend a lot of time rolling up their sleeves to keep it going to save money. And they're not, most of these people are not eating sushi on their boats. So, um, and so I have been boating since the early 80s. And I can attest to the fact that uh, during the 80s, the Chicago Harbor System was full, that there were people, unfortunately, putting mon money under the table at that time was actually required to get a slip. It was a really popular system. It's the biggest system in the United States, 5,000 slips and buoys. Um, part of that is because we're the third largest city and 20 miles of lakefront. Um, at the time in the 80s, they built this harbor down in Hammond. And they built a harbor up in Waukegan, which was relatively small. And it was dead up there. <laughs> they had problems really just, it was embarrassing to see how many boats were put in there. Except Chicago did them a big favor. They did a, prop, they did a tax. It was a 50% boat tax. And Waukegan and Hammond loved it. They filled up. The Chicago boaters said, screw you, and they took off. And since that time, they built a much nicer harbor in Waukegan, and they also built one a little farther north in Zion. And there are people who've gotten used to that, and they still do, those harbors do pretty well. So I would respectfully suggest to the speaker that there's a great book on this topic. Uh, it's called Dirty Waters. And it was written by the last Chicago Harbor boss. He was uh, put in place by, um, uh, his name's Nelson, his last name's Nelson, and he was put in place under the Washington administration. And he, he's proud to claim that he was, uh, out of uh, his last five predecessors, he was the only person who wasn't sent to prison. And he did a tremendous amount of improvements, and I can attest to that because I witnessed them all. Um, and, uh, and he talks about how the harbor system is really, there are a tremendous number of middle class people who use the boating, the, the boating system. And he also talks about the missed opportunity 
that uh, people look at Chicago and the Park District and they think that the city boundary ends at the lake. And he, as a person with experience in boating recreation, sees the city recreation expanding past the lakefront and doesn't feel that the Chicago system utilizes that. And it's a way to bring enjoyment to a lot more people and more revenue. Um, he was booted out when uh, Richard M. put in Claypool in charge of the, uh, the park district. So they said, see you later, and then they privatized the park, the, uh, the harbor system. So that's my suggestion. If that, That's a perspective of someone that uh, I think you would appreciate is by looking at that book. Uh, the other thing is you talked about the, uh, the sugar tax, um, the, the sugar pop tax, and I have a very strong opinion about this. Uh, I loved your idea of how you present it to people so they don't feel they're totally, uh, they're totally burdened, uh, middle, uh, middle income or low income. But there, the other factor is that sugar, and, and this, is, this is really harsh for people to hear, but that's because there's a big industry that doesn't, that ignores this or benefits from it. Sugar is addictive and it's a poison. It, it really is. It just, there is zero. It is, it is a, a consumption product that has literally zero nutritional value. And people consume, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's no reason that the people, that the people in that industry spent a ton of money uh, fighting Preckwinkle when she proposed this uh, tax. Uh, it is uh, addictive and it leads to obesity, which leads to all sorts of heart problems, um, cardiovascular problems like diabetes, even in kids, stroke, heart attack, which drives up our prices because we have a healthcare system where Chicagoans pay for the poor people of Chicago for their terrible diet. Um, I know my time's up, but my... That's okay. But my big, my big point is to consider is this. When, when people taxed cigarettes, we all in hindsight realized that cigarettes are just poison. But there was a time when it was very hard for people and part of that was because we were all used to consuming cigarettes. And now they're having studies that are showing that uh, high cigarette taxes have uh, the biggest reduction in cigarette use is with youth. The higher the taxes go. Okay, and and so the the theory is is that if you jack up the taxes on uh, sugar pop, you're going to see a similar effect on a youth who see it, and it will hopefully improve the the health of <coughs> our youth, our citizens, and the taxpayers. Thank you. All right. All right. You got my fellow Americans. Thorium reacted. No, the problem, the problem with cigarette taxes is that when you set them in the city of Chicago or you set them at a local thing, you go into the city at proper $12 a pack. Yet you can drive to Bensonville, Illinois and get in for $7.50, maybe $8 a pack. You get out to McHenry County. 750 a pack. Thank God I'm not paying for a lot of those now because I have effectively quit. Yeah. I still have. Yeah. I, yeah. I still yeah. indulge about maybe one a week or something like that. I'm still having a lot of trouble keeping it up with cold turkey, so I say it with trepidation. But I've effectively quit, so that does put a lot of money in my pocket. And yes, I do know that when uh, I cringed every time I ran out in the city because it's almost $14 out of my pocket. And it's a heck of a lot more than uh, seven fifty dollars a pack. But I can tell you right now, um, when, uh, you know, when you make it so easy, sometimes the taxes will not have their desired effect. Just simply drive business back out to the suburbs, back out to the places where they go. I happen to know an individual who had a gas station 
and he had it on Cook County right across the street, was, I think, Lake County. And he bought another station because of the anticipated taxes on Cook County cigarettes, knowing that people would just go across the street to buy one. So, again, if you're going to raise taxes, make sure they're consistent across the board. I'm not exactly saying that uh, it's a good thing, but, you know, if you're a smoker, pay for your medical costs and make sure you can keep your stuff. Same thing with time or anything else. I'm all for a lot of these liberal ideas, but legalize it and tax it. And I think we'll see a lot of our problems go away. Anyway, thank you very much for allowing me to ramble tonight. Yay! Said, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're living in a time that um, our oppressors call neoliberalism. But by mean what they mean by that, if they go into another country, these uh, powerful banks and these corporations. What they try to do and get these people into debt, and then they can't pay the debt. So what they do is they they privatize what's uh, we used to belong to the state or the county or the city, like the waterworks or the telephone works or the or the infrastructure, the roads, whatever you, you want to do. That's that's how they make tremendous profit. And the same time, they got huge markets, but they don't know if they could invest in those um, markets because a lot of these markets are saturated. That people just don't have the money to buy back the goods that were produced. So what they do is they're trying to break the unions, and we just heard about public unions being broken where uh, people, if they don't belong to a union, let's say in the school, or the janitors using in the school, or other places, so what they do is they pay them lower and lower amounts of uh, wages. And that's how they make their profit. And, and the latest statistic, three people own half as much wealth as the entire planet, or the United States. And these three people are uh, Gates, Bezos, and there's another one, I forget his name exactly, but he owns the uh, Gifo. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, that's the one. These three people have so much wealth, and they're not going to give it up. But what I find encouraging is that uh, Bernie Sanders get a, got a huge vote in the last election, and they say if he was running against Trump, he would have won. <laughs> so people are real disenchanted, and what the other person brought out, that people don't have money anymore, and one of the other statistics, 140 million people in the United States are living real close to poverty or are in deep poverty. So the market isn't all there, and they're trying to squeeze more and more and more out of the people that work, and that's why the uh, Supreme Court voted that if somebody belongs to a public union, and they, they don't really have to pay the dues. So what they're trying to do is break the unions. But the unions have been pretty weak for the most part. Uh, the highest level of unions was probably after the Second World War, a little bit after that, because of Ro Roosevelt's New Deal, he recognized the unions. But now they're trying to break all unions, and we have what we call wage slavery, that is people work a certain amount of hours, and they give them the money that has come to them during those few hours. But the rest of the hours they work for, they're slaves, in other words, they're working for the corporation or they're working for the bank. So the uh, exploitation level has gone real high, and the exploitation level 
if they keep going like it is and get even higher. And what they're not anticipating, a downturn in the economy, I think is going to happen fairly soon. It usually happens about once every 10 years or so. And we're at that 10-year period. So it might happen very soon. And so people have to organize, like our speaker is trying to organize and trying to get people to vote for somebody that isn't in this neoliberal type of setup. And we have to build that up, not only in Chicago, but all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Because Britain and other countries are also in this neoliberal type of environment. All right, next, Mr. Zucker. So what are you going to do about the poor corporations? Are you to the boat backstage? First of all, <laughs> First of all, I heard some mention of the South Shore Railroad somehow being converted into some kind of an ally, an elevated line. That system is maintained by the state of Indiana, and it's not maintained uh, necessarily for just for the people of Illinois. It's maintained to bring the people of Indiana and Lake Porter and Laporte counties into Chicago and vice versa. It's funded primarily by the state of Indiana with a small subsidy from Metro. So there's not going to be any, any re, there's not going to be any interest, I doubt, in uh, converting it into some kind of L, L line, some kind of rapid transit line here in Chicago. Indeed, the people who live in the southern parts of Lake Porter and Laporte counties, around Crown Point, Valparaiso, and Laporte, have made it very plain that they don't want a lot of damn northerners as they. Consider the people of the northern portions of those counties and in Illinois coming down to where they live, period. Except they're happy to have us spend money down there in their restaurants. Well, they got cheap cigarettes down there, too. <laughs> that's right, but that's about it. They don't want to so tons of people coming down there to live or to work. Um, I also heard when I asked about Mayor Daly. Now, there are many things that I liked about Mayor Daly. He was a great mayor. There's some things that I didn't. And not everybody in Chicago benefited from his mayoralty. It, uh, most of the African American community were shut out. People who didn't agree with him were shut out. So I don't know that the 11th, the 11th Ward may at that time have worked well for the people of the 11th Ward, many of whom had jobs down in City Hall and in, in the county building and what later became known as the Daly Center, the, the Civic Center then. But a lot of people didn't. Thank you. Next. Five. Uh, yeah, another poem, I hope. <laughs> Thank you, David, uh, for a great presentation. Uh, I brought some flyers about the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, they're in the back, and I'd like to read uh, an important part of that flyer that we can't repeat enough. Real change doesn't start in D.C. The real backbone of the Poor People's Campaign has <coughs> been the patient work of community organizing. <clears throat> this is one of the campaign's core values. Real change doesn't start in DC. It begins with the people doing on the ground work in their own communities. There will be no national campaign. There will be no power at the national level unless there's power at the state level in every state, said Najimi Zurinko coordinator for the campaign in Pennsylvania. We have to develop leaders at the state level because if this campaign is not a place where poor and dispossessed people are comfortable, then it's nothing. If it's not a place where poor and dispossessed people are leading, then it's nothing. In 35 states, local leaders are educating people about the history of the campaign, <laughs> hosting trainings in nonviolent civil disobedience, and coaching those who have been directly affected to tell their stories. It's a bottom-up movement of people speaking for themselves, said Reverend Carolyn Foster. But many times, people need help doing that because they have been so disempowered. So bottom-up 
movement politics is what we talk about a lot. Um, change doesn't happen from power down, money down, influence down. It happens from community members up, family members up, labor unions up, everyday people up. Because that's where the real power is, because the power is in our solidarity, and our cooperation, and our ideas, and our voices. So it's true, on the scoreboard of money, we're losing. But on the scoreboard of ideas, when we show up, we've won. And maybe we haven't always won the biggest goal we had, but we have won the goals that have got us closer to the goal that we have, which is being an actual civilized participatory democracy. What I liked in your talk is when you talked about full funding for the arts and the humanities. What I liked in your talk is talking about renewable energy. And I don't know if you mentioned the Green New Deal, but I certainly heard Civilian Conservation Corps, so I pretty much am hearing the Green New Deal suggestions. Uh, taxing the LaSalle District. This is an issue that every time I go to Springfield with my brothers and sisters to uh, lobby uh, legislators in Springfield, they it's like kryptonite. They don't want to talk about it because they know who runs Springfield. It's the same thing everywhere all across the country. If you talk about taxing the rich proportionally the way they do in other parts of the industrialized world, you're suddenly a persona non grata. Well, when you said you didn't want any corporate money, I love the fact that you said that because it sounds like you understand where that leads you, which is, it's like a financial noose around your neck. You can't actually do the things your constituents uh, elected you to do. So I was happy to hear that. I was happy to hear about full funding for public schools. Uh, my father was a retired uh, community college physics teacher, and uh, he couldn't believe that uh, education was ever a question of, do we full fund it this year or not? He just always was like, really? That's the thing they're going to attack, budget time, not the military industrial boondoggle complex. Uh, it's just an odd country that we're in. The majority of we the people want full funding for education, but the legislators continue to pull out this public relations BS campaign that somehow that's not a priority at the very top. Uh, Amazon is a modern day plantation. It does not treat its workers with respect. It does not treat its workers with dignity. And every time Rahm Emanuel gets up there and says how wonderful it is, he should win the Academy Award because he knows full well it's just another in a long, long list of things that didn't come from anywhere that, unless it always came from, no surprise, places like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase and all those hedge fund uh, managers and Wall Street banksters. You said Uber is not good for workers and women. I agree with you 100%. Uh, I've taken Uber once in my lifetime, just you know, like I go to McDonald's to use the restroom. Uh, I used Uber once in my lifetime, so they exist out there. But I don't let myself become enslaved to them. I support taxis. I support the CTA. I support the L train. I support the metro. And on days when it's not snowing and raining, I walk because Uber is not going to win this person's hard-earned pay. Um, I'm glad your campaign is, is, is there to remind us that uh, the Poor People's Campaign's values are alive and well in the city of Chicago. I wish I had more time for my rebuttal because I also did have a poem, but uh, I can't read it, but I'll give you a copy of it. Good luck on your campaign, David. Yeah, three or four minutes. We got plenty of time. Okay, well, if your indulgence, uh, College of Complexes, I'll read a quick poem for David. What they really should type on those Nile hiring signs is we make so much off wage slavery, now there's no end in sight. What they really should hype up those nickel and dimes, now there's no such thing as liberty because cartels rule our lives. What they really should write on those for rent signs is we ward and bled our souls to their end for what price. What they really should light up those for sale signs is we've corporated ourselves to near death this time. We all know that it don't have to be like this. We all know there's in all of us greatness. We all know that it don't need to be like this. We all know there's in all of us, there's no name for it yet. So to all the hyped false hopes, to all the could yet don'ts, to all the can but won'ts, we vow to pay no mind. To all the blocked roads because the haves when it comes to silver and gold are really the have nots when it comes to heart and soul. We're not going south or east or west or north. We are going sky. Thank you, David.
Okay. Is this some... I want to briefly update a couple of things here real quick. Wow. Um, I uh, did talk to Ernie Norman this week. He had an accident. He seems to be somewhat recovering okay. Another one of our college kind of irregulars who come in is Paul Racino. He had a bad auto accident yesterday. He's okay, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, maybe a little bit if you call him or give him a little support, it might be very helpful that you know. And uh, I don't know how Brahm's doing, but has anybody recently talked to him? Okay, we'll make sure we call him up again. But anyway, I just thought you'd like to know. I did talk to Ernie, and he seems to be doing okay. And uh, my friend Paul's okay, except the car is going on. But thanks again. Why didn't you do this thing in the announcement for Because I forgot. All right. You go on? Yeah. Go ahead. Come on. You got nothing to say anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. All right, Doc. I even forgot my Sean Spicer invitation. Beware. Hey, uh, where is this guy? What's this guy that's got the office here? Thomas Daly? Daly Thompson. Patrick Daly Thompson. Is he related, related to... Um, he's, a, he's a grandson of one, first mayor Daly and then uh, nephew of second mayor. Oh, so he's a crook. He's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you want to get... If you, uh, I know Charlie's a big establishment Democrat. But um, if you want to cause some ruckus and get your name on the uh, ballot, how many people are running? Just so far, me and him. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, trace back the um, uh, the mysterious parking meters through Dubai, in Spain, in Australia, in Chase Manhattan, Chase J P Morgan, and follow the money <laughs> as it goes back to the. A you know, bank account of the Baileys. Yeah, it'll be tough, but you know. So you know the Dailies are a crook because it's crooks because they privatized infrastructure. And then I heard Rom and Rom's brother own part of Uber or on the board of Uber. So you know there's all kinds of crooked stuff here. Not all kinds, but you gotta you gotta bust their asses. All right, um, just that. Uh, just some. Uh, uh, I bike around your neighborhood occasionally, go to Sox games, and um, you guys really need to, uh, you know, Halstead's kind of an asset. I mean, that's at University Village, UIC. I know it gets industrial there, and then industrial down by the, um, what was it called? Amphitheater. I don't think there's anything there at the, the amphitheater, except for the industrial park. And then Sox Park's near. So I hope your uh, theater gets rebuilt. That Thalia Hall over in Pilsen, I think, was an old theater. And now it's a rock and roll club. Um, and um, uh, what else? Oh, yeah, get a Dollar Tree and an Aldi in your neighborhood. <laughs> we got a Dollar Tree. No family dollar. Hell with that. Or general dollar. Dollar Tree and Aldi, and your your world will explode. <laughs> it sounds stupid, but it's true. Uh, anyway, and you need subsidized housing. You know, if we're going to give away money by Obama, we're going to give the rich in Wall Street all the bailouts. We need to subsidize. Get real serious about subsidies, especially with the unions gone, and uh, you know the one per, you know just bad wages stuck. <laughs> 30, I mean, I was making $11 an hour on a truck dock in college 30 years ago, and people are still making $11. I was, I was like, yeah, and I paid union dues, which, actually I didn't pay union dues, but I was part of the union Teamsters. But I got the benefit of that wage because of the unions. That was in the news. You know, speaking of uh, this, this, I guess this, the Supreme Court uh, Justice was a real asshole, Kennedy. Can I say that asshole? Anyway, so uh, I gotta give my kudos to Rom because I think I, I like Rom. You know, I hate him, but you know, he, he on Chicago Tonight last night he blasted Kennedy. He goes, listen, this son of a uh, this asshole 
uh, Kennedy, everybody's making him out to be a, a middle of the road moderate. And this jerk is it turned over um, uh, Bush v. Gore. So Kennedy gave us Bush. Okay. Also, Kennedy gave us the PACs, where. Those are good things, though. What? They have corporations? They have free as much speech. Okay, yeah. yeah corporations, right, yeah. free speech, my ass. <laughs> and, and so Kennedy gave us that, gave us the um, Citizens United. You got it, Charlie. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's it, yeah, this asshole. Don't have and, then, uh, and then this last thing with the anti-union, where, yeah. you know, you, you go, forget collective bargaining. So, yeah, this Kennedy's a real bad guy. Beat him up. About as bad as those Wall Street bankers, huh? Okay, Wall Street. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, don't, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Well, I'll end with Wall Street. So, um, yeah, so, you know, of course, you know by now that I've explained many times before, Obama printed for $15 trillion for, for Wall Street and propped up the 1%, and <laughs> unfortunately, that added to the, you know, the wage discrepancy and the wealth discrepancy in this country. Do you want me to talk more about Wall Street and how bad it is? No, because it's not a bad institution. It's we a just bunch of speculators <laughs> trading paper. Yeah. I work in the real economy. Do you work in the real economy? Yes. Yeah, so screw the, the casino economy. <laughs> <laughs> where do you think where do you think the uh Oh what? Where do you think funding comes for companies? Banks. Wall Street, yeah. Not speculators. It comes from labor. There you go. A lot of other forks. But you still, you still need the IPOs. You still need the stock stocks. market crash in 08 was caused by speculators and derivatives and options. That I agree with. It was nothing but a Obama bunch of lies. Obama and that idiot attorney general, what's his name, Holder, didn't throw anybody in jail. Jerks. We should. Because they're part of the establishment, like Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Forget it, Bill. It was awesome. What happened to your White you Sox? Like they, they were they won the series the back in '06, and now they haven't done the shit. They're saying in the 2020s, baseball in Chicago will be awesome. Really? Both sides of town will be in the in the World Series. So you're speculating that the Cubs and Sox will have a series, huh? Yeah, Subway Series. Right well, that, that's series. that's something to live for. You're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> How many more people want to give a rebuttal? Charlie, come on. That, yeah, come on, Charlie. The establishment. He got some right. time tonight too, so he can. Nobody applauded you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker for uh, his presentation coming here tonight and uh, for his demonstration of good citizenship by running for office here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, I've been, as you're well aware of, oh, first of all, I'd like to announce that uh, I volunteered there for many, many years, but every 4th of July, the um, uh, Chicago History Society at uh, North Avenue on the lake has a 4th of July thing, 10 to noon. But in addition to that, the museum is free after that. So if you don't really want to listen to this patriotic music and stuff, uh, you can still avail yourself of the museum that afternoon. Uh, and I highly recommend it if you haven't been there in a while and seen their current exhibits. Uh, let's see what else. All right, start again. Uh, number one issue with that my concern is transit, transportation. Um, 11 Ward actually should sell itself like the CTA used to have like 10 minutes to the loop. Something like, uh, you know, the convenience of the loop, um, you know, without the cost or something, you know. Uh, it would be a very le legitimate campaign. It's in close proximity. It's one of the reasons I reside there having worked in uh, downtown and the convenience of getting to and for I could actually even go home at noon and get have lunch and get back very conceivably but I'd like to I think any candidate would be um, good to become apprised 
of the legitimate projects regarding the district. Uh, why we seniors are, were denied? Why do we have to pay transit fare when the system is paid for by the rush hour riders? And it's, it brings in no real revenue to the system and it costs nothing because they had no new vehicles or operators. Uh, issues like that, uh, that would be a benefit to the senior community. Believe you me, seniors rely on transit. My mother used to borrow my bus pass even to go like two blocks or so because she had different mobility issues. So if they rely on it very heavily. And that's why I think this food store that has been vacant for a number of years, you talk about that, it was an Aldi type store. And I miss it. And it also had a feature, it had home delivery. You could box up your groceries, which was a nice benefit for the people in the community there. Um, I, it, it saddens me. I, I have no real issue with the other stores. I can get to the other stores, of course, with no problem. But uh, I believe that would be something a priority for the community so that we don't become a food desert. I realize it's a keystone of your campaign, and I don't know anything about public schools or education, really, but the high school, Kelly High School was recently renovated, not that long ago, because I know the person who had a move for the renovation. And just in passing, it's a relatively new facility, and I would think beefing that up and maybe Tilton would be, if it's still around, Tilton High School would be uh, much more beneficial on, the, on this. And getting the 62 buses has been problematic of late. So, that, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, other things you got, somebody put in call the sets. There's an architectural kind of plan in the area, which I think should immediately and summarily each and every one of those should be removed there and put to traffic. Um, the thing with the energy thing is um, the people are concerned about taking advantage of some of those programs, myself in particular, because you may leave yourself the common fear is you, you invite these energy people into your home and you're just inviting trouble from building code inspectors. And that is why I have not taken advantage of it, nor will my sister want anything to do with that. If you've ever had a deal with building code people, you can fully comprehend the reason why they would be an impediment to any sort of energy project in a household. I assure you, I guarantee you, Brad Little just called me. He's going through that. Um, let's see, I lived in Manhattan. Uh, uh, Raj. And I don't know what you're talking about. Places on like Columbus Avenue and Amsterdam were dangerous <laughs> uh, places to go. I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, I used to go to the thing called the Apollo 12 bar, you know. But that was just to see who would get killed or something, you know. So you're talking about Manhattan working or something, you know. Maybe you hung around a different part of town, man. <laughs> but I, I was on the Spanish Harlem. Are you kidding me, man? I didn't want to know. There, there, there was low life and dirt and filth and <laughs> just the outcast of society on the streets 24 hours a day, you know. And you don't hate. But anyhow, good luck on your campaign. There's many things to turn. And you're darn right, where's that guy? You're darn right, I'm a machine guy. And the machine does one thing, it delivers the vote. And I have a lot of respect for the independent candidates, so to speak, um, who do that. I was thinking about it, the number of independents that I've known who have sought office. It's difficult to succeed. The odds are against you. It is doable. It does happen as it did the other day in New York. But it is difficult. We alluded to it here, collecting signatures and fighting off challenges. Uh, and third parties always have it. These guys are, are experts at, at making it difficult for other candidates who do not have their approval. But um, if you keep at it, you can succeed. 
Um, you really got to think about what you're doing, though. Just knocking on as many doors and killing yourself, I don't think is going to do it. I've seen that, and I'm sincere. And it may be the case, but I personally and professionally don't know if that's the way that's going to do it. Like the other guys don't campaign at all, and and you kill yourself morning, noon, and night. And I've seen some candidates right in this district. There was a guy who really went at it. He gave himself his, his everything he had at it, and he really didn't have much success in that regard. Now there were every election has its own factors, but anyhow. All right, Andy, it's all yours. Okay. Good luck, Mr. Candidate. Charlie? Yeah. Yeah, but where'd you live in Manette? It's working. It's like, hey, that's all I got with it. It's like to do a guy with a dog at night. I can get out of the beer. Here, take it back. You fuck with the guy with the dog or the guy with the dog? Hello. Uh, I just have a few quick observations here that. Uh, I think I've seen in the last week a lot of people are writing about uh, some core issues that have to be addressed in America if we're going to make any progress. Now this, this young 28-year-old woman that won in New York, it was a shocker to the Democratic Party as, as much as the Republicans because they didn't think anybody running a platform talking about helping the common man and woman could actually get elected in America and people turn out in droves, it was a landslide. Uh, she was talking about, she ran a, a platform of, of, of universal rights, what should be rights, right to housing, right to a living wage, you know, guaranteed jobs, uh, jobs work program by the government for everybody who wants to work if the private sector won't provide it. Uh, they want, she wants to abolish ICE, uh, have universal health care, there was an article uh, on one of the websites just after Trump uh, appointed, uh, raised the military budget. If Trump had left the military budget the same, that amount of money that he raised it, uh, the money was there, could provide universal health care all the way through college, uh, uh, universal college, universal college for every student in America that wants to go to college. This is how General Smedley Butler and Dwight Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex having their hands around the throat of the American people. Uh, and Martin Luther King said, any society that spends more on the machinery of death than it does on social programs is itself heading towards spiritual death. Paraphrase a little yeah. bit, that's the essence of it. Uh, many, many great thinkers over the years have said, this type of military spending, wasting resources that could be used for all kinds of other things that are commonly available in modern countries. This kind of military spending is not sustainable or survivable, period. And this kind of military spending and the billionaires in charge, it's all escalated since one day in our history. Things changed. Before that day, we didn't have a Department of Homeland Security. We didn't have a Department of Ice. We didn't have heavily armed SWAT looking policemen whipping out their pistols and just blowing away black people at random. There's always been abuse, but not like we have since that one day in history that was sold to us. A seventh grader can do the math, and yet we have people walking around adult, college-educated, PhD people saying, on that subject, look at me, I'm dumber than a fifth grader, and I'm proud of it. Well, it's time, Is there's an article uh, yesterday, I printed it, more and more people, the article went viral, by the way, it says, fuck civility. He says, we're talking about, no, you have to be civil to your uh, opponent, you can't, uh, use harsh language on the Senate floor or the Congress. Well, he said, fuck that. When you're dealing with predators and killers, civility isn't going to make them. You have to deal with these people 
in language that they'll understand, and you have to take effective measures that will deal with the problem. I, don't, I, I probably read uh, 100 authors, 50 books in the last few years. They've all said the same thing. We are not going to get America back from the billionaire killers that are running it right now until we face the reality of the number seven. Seven buildings were destroyed in a real estate fraud, the largest real estate fraud in history. All seven buildings were prepped and ex uh, demolished by a demolition company. They were prepped in advance. The corporate billionaires have control of the media. So they had their media set up cameras around the first two buildings. They filmed the first two, the destruction of the first two, and they sold it as a terrorist attack. The owner, the, the developer, got that control of that complex. He had taken out several billion dollars worth of terrorist insurance so he wouldn't have to pay for the demolition of all seven buildings himself. What We're was talking the name of the demolition company? <laughs> There were several involved, but we don't need it. I don't know the name of it personally, Charlie, but that's a red herring. We know what was done. We know what was done. See, Charlie is an example of some an adult that says, look at me, I'm dumber than a fucking fifth grader on this subject. I, I, I'll call you out on it. Every time you stand up and say, look at me, I can't understand simple math. All you need to do is look at any one of the videos that shows the forensic evidence. Seven buildings were leveled and destroyed, not two, seven. And the two that the, where the Twin Towers were converted to dust, they rolled over Lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust, and the media sold it as a Hollywood-style uh, terrorist movie. In fact, one movie maker that had made a terrorist event with planes a year earlier, he said, this feels like my movie. He said, this looks like a movie. This feels like the movie I made. Well, that's how they sold it. All the pieces of the legend of Osama bin Laden in 9-11 and 19 lucky hijackers, that was all a myth sold to us by the media. And on that day, they began running, they began running a coordinated blackout on the scientists and the people that built the towers. Scientists, airplane uh, crash investigators, airplane pilots, every piece of the story of 9-11 is a total fairy tale. And we're not going to get our country back. We're not going to stop seeing ICE ripping children away from their families. And ICE is using SWAT tactics to break in in the middle of the night. They're terrorizing poor people. This was never, never, ever about protecting America. The Department of Homeland Security and checking people for toenail clippers at the airports, that's not about protecting America. That's about educating the public and convict, convict, conditioning them just like people were conditioned in Germany. So they, they say you stop at a checkpoint. You have your papers, please? Papers, please. That's what you get in a police state. And Jim, Jim Mars wrote a book on that. It's called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. He said, picture all those Nazis that escaped Germany laying low for a while and then the survivors coalescing back into some country to try to make uh, have the rise of the fourth Reich. Well, he said, you don't have to imagine that. It's here. It's this country. The Bush family has ties to the Nazis going back to the 20s. That's who that family is. They supported the Nazis in World War II. These people the have... President the United States is a Nazi. The United States is being converted by people that are using the Nazi game plan. That's what's happening. And if you keep laughing about them and dying it, you're doing it. Look at me, I'm a fifth grader. Insurance. I can't understand regular English. I can't read a fucking word on a book like this. I can read other stuff. I can talk about trains till the cows come home. I'm probably the most knowledgeable person on trains and transport and public edu public transport that you're going to see within 100 miles of here. But on, on the subject of 9-11, I'm dumber than a fifth grader. Well, what can be done about that, Charlie? Why don't you crack a book and join the rest of us and, and move well, forward. Let's well, take our country back from the criminals that are running it, right? I read it all and I came away not believe Bullshit. You didn't crack one of the books that I gave you. Because if you did, you'd have to stand up and say, I can't read at fifth grade level. And I know you can read better than fifth grade Judy's level. Book? What? Judy's book? No, not Judy's book. This lady over here, this lady over here, uh, she left already. She held up a book called Irrevi. That means an irreverent look at nuclear power, written by John Gauntlet. He's a scientist. He was one of our. He's wrong. Huh? He's wrong about nuclear power. Well, 
here's Tim doing the imitation. I can't <laughs> read it at a fifth grade level on that show. I, I, I can I, read it at a college yeah, level. Right? I strongly, I, I strongly, I, I, I strongly take take a little bit of things about reading at a fifth grade level because I've been taking a look at this stuff for a while. Well, you have to look at other stuff that talks about the reality. You haven't been facing the reality. That's oh, I have. Oh, and when you're, you're telling when you're standing in a blizzard of evidence and you can't see. And you're telling me like, attending the Thorium Energy Alliance conference at least four yeah. times and okay, talking that's to some of the scientists. Our speaker gets the last word. Okay. Come on here. A fifth grader. Okay, let's, let's hope that everybody can open okay. their minds beyond fifth grade level to hear our speech. All right. <laughs> because something against fifth grade. It's reality. I have. All right. Let's hear it. Let's give our courage. Let's give our speaker the courage of listening to him for our last word. No, there was just I wanted to group a few things in terms of concrete policies. Um, we need to disperse. There's a there's a cluster of concerns with affordable housing. We need to disperse uh, the CHE funds that are being held back. Uh, there's allocation questions with aldermanic prerogative being used to mix affordable housing. We need to be very very careful with that because that could be a backdoor for discrimination. Uh, in terms of CTA affordability that ties in with affordable housing. Um, we need better data at the 11th ward level. There's generational differences where, in general, older people think that it's a car neighborhood and younger people think you don't need a car. And so that actually uh, limits where people don't want to see like you know three to five story buildings built which could help with housing density affordability. And I think we need better data because my hunch is it's, it's actually training new people who are moving there because it doesn't need a car. And if we had some good data on how people use the neighborhood, whether they have cars or not, we could like build some uh, more five story buildings that would help with uh, housing affordability. Um, Indiana Train, I'll look into it. Uh, if with Amazon, if just so there's no questions, um, I think we should bust up big companies, not bow down to them. So, uh, there's no questions where I stand with that. There was a huge question with taxation, um, any sort of tax. Uh, well, there's misallocated money. A lot of the development funds, like River Point Condo Complex downtown, is $30 million for a huge office building with a luxury steakhouse, $125 ribeyes. That money is simply misused. That's better. You could be better off uh, funding home solar off something like that. Uh, with any given tax, uh, there was a question of like cigarette pop taxes. You should probably have it carefully calibrated so you do get some income, but you don't drive business away, for example, something with a boat. Um, in general, there were some questions with like uh, drawn back to world financial uh, issues. Uh, we need to go after tax havens using the internet and have it coordinated at an international level. Thomas Piketty raised this in his work on uh, capital in the 21st century. And we need to be a lot more ambitious than we have been to go after those one percenters stashing stuff like in the Cayman Islands. Um, and when we also tax, we need to not only go back to Eisenhower tax level tax rates, we might have to have a one-time tax because it's been clear now that they've been playing the system for decades and they've been heaping up stuff year after year after year. For, so for those mega rich, you might should, maybe should have one-time penalties in addition to restoring like the Eisenhower level tax rates. Um, questions, last ones were with uh, there was questions about uh, Chinese American community. A lot of people that are stretched thin, uh, they would welcome like uh, priorities in terms of uh, taxation rates. Uh, with the population growth at the north end of the war, Chinatown, also South Loop, there is the level, there is the need for another high school. There's enough seats. Um, they're shutting, shuttering a National Teachers Academy elementary school. That should be maintained as an elementary school and have a newly built high school with enough room for the communities at the northern end of the ward. That's also south of a different ward. Um, and lastly, with doability, um, stuff from the mural project would be within my own infrastructure budget. Uh, CPS, you can just lobby right now. And our current alderman hasn't been lobbying. I'd at least be an active lobbyist on those issues so to do the right thing. And then um, with property tax issues, that's a make or break issue, I think. And if another tax increase like that goes through, it'll devastate the war. Um, and in this instance, maybe I couldn't get it 
through what we need to do to raise revenue, I could hold other aldermen accountable, and that is in my powers, where I would be, I would look to form coalitions so that we could mail every single voter in a ward where an alderman uh, voted for another property tax increase and tell them exactly what their alderman did to them. And if they made the right decision on that, and they think they made the right decision, they should have no trouble answering for that. And I look forward to working with them collegially, but they gotta be held accountable if they try to pull that again on us. All right. And uh, lastly, uh, I have a special place in my heart for free thinkers. This is a grand tradition. Thomas Paine, Ernestine Rose, Abner Neelan, and uh, God is bless you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Hi. Hey, Jimmy. That's, is that it for the night? Is everybody ready to adjourn? Yep. Yeah, and then we are adjourned, and we will see you next week. Next week, we have uh, Venom's fires over here. Venom's way over here.